All right. Um, welcome to this session of of the Horaces um, Asia Meeting 2021. Uh, my name is Alejandro Reyes. I'm a Director of Knowledge Dissemination at the Asia Global Institute, a think tank here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm also a professor at the University of Hong Kong. This is a session on the um, Sustainable Development Goal number eight, and that SDG goal number eight demands decent work for all. The onset of uh, COVID-19 and job insecurity that has resulted, I'm told, uh, I guess, hundreds of millions of people uh, potentially have lost their jobs. Um, uh, the job insecurity in this uh, period uh, of um, late stage capitalism, I guess is what they're calling it, hinder, uh, th these two things are hindering the achievement of SDG 8 uh, by 2030. So we're here to discuss with uh, a rather broadly uh, situated panel, uh, geographically diverse panel, how badly has COVID-19 affected workers in this part of the world? But we can also uh, talk about uh, the impact on other parts of the world. And what can be done to shore up their livelihoods through fiscal and social innovation? Um, and thinking also uh, about the, the whole sustainability agenda. I think that uh, we certainly have people here who can talk about that. And um, by how much has Asian innovation and entrepreneurship, or specifically just generally innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, how has that been restricted by COVID-19? So uh, let me introduce the panel in the reverse order uh, from which they will, by, uh, in which they will speak. So um, we might expect additional panelists, but I'm, I'm going to um, introduce the ones that are currently present, um, and we'll introduce others uh, if, if, if they should be able to join us. Um, firstly, uh, Pietro Paganini, who's co-founder of Competere Italy, uh, which is a, uh, I think in your website, Pietro, you describe yourself as the chief curiosity officer uh, yes, of indeed. Think tank. So, so uh, you, you 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 deal in policies for sustainability. That's the tagline. Uh, so, welcome. Um, Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, now we're in fact we're joined by Offer uh, Wexler. Uh, thank you very much, Offer, for for joining us. So, Offer Wexler is co-founder of NAM Technology Israel, which is a smart energy company um, developing saving energy solutions for the cooling industry and also uh, offer, I believe, your uh, also uh, a certified public accountant as well as an advisor, financial advisor. So thank you very much and uh, welcome to join us. And we are also joined by Alex Schmidt, um, who is chairman of the supervisory board of Capitea in Poland. Um, and this is a, a credit in dis intermediation um, a firm uh, with portfolio management and collection agency work, I believe. I, 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 I visited the website. I, I don't know if I've covered everything that your company does, but you can certainly fill us in uh, later. Um, then uh, we are joined by um, Catherine Wolf in uh, Singapore. She's co-founder and managing director of 33 Talent, a, sing a human resource consultancy. So um, thank you very much for joining us and thank you all. Now, please, uh, for those folks who are uh, listening, please uh, um, uh, send us some questions through the, uh, uh, the comment or uh, question box at the bottom of your screen, I believe uh, it's quite visible. Um, and uh, we, we can take them on as we discuss or towards the end of the session. So Catherine, if I could start with you, could you tell us a about the job losses and the efforts to address this challenge from your perspective in Singapore. Yeah, thank you, Alejandro. Um, so, um, yeah, I was actually just looking up some stats, actually, so that, um, you know, we could hand over some data in the um, in the forum today about the job losses in Singapore. And, um, oh, I see my video has just gone a little bit dark. Is that okay for you? Uh, you are a little dark. But, yeah, uh, but maybe it's the lighting or something. I don't know. Uh, mm, 
Okay, let's just see whether it's, it, it could be the internet connection bandwidth for some reason. Let's yeah. just see if that pops back on. But um, I think it's okay. It, 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 yeah, it, it, okay. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I can tell you from working here on the ground in Singapore. Um, so we work with um, government agencies. Um, we also work with the private sector and we work with the smaller startup scenes and we also work with the big multinational companies. So we have we have actually um, quite a representative array of, of partners that we work with. Um, and it was obvious that there were lots and lots of job losses happening. Um, what I found out just in the research um, as I was looking through it, preparing for today is that there was actually um, 15 times more jobs lost in the COVID crisis than there was in the global financial crisis in Singapore. So it, it's 15 just times- Just in Singapore. Just in Singapore, it's 15 times worse than the global financial crisis. Um, so it, it's been a heavy um, job loss in Singapore. And um, as a result, the government responded um, by creating a lot of upskilling programs, which would take advantage of the latent t- period. I mean, I think Singapore is, is a sort of digital first, like technical first champion when it comes to nations around the world. Um, and I think they saw two opportunities. One was to actually, um, you know, use this period where people are out, out of work to actually digitally reskill like vast numbers of the nation. Um, and secondly, um, that this would actually improve their chances of finding work again. So it was both a sort of um, uh, a chance to reskill large numbers of people, but also increase their chances of getting back into work. Um, so where we stand now is that um, there's actually uh, the, the lead indicator on employment is usually job vacancies. You know, so when you see lots and lots and lots of vacancies being mm-hmm. advertised, then then in a month or two's time, then of course lots and lots of those jobs will have been filled and and the unemployment figures will start to reduce. Um, So at the moment in Singapore, there's a record high, an all-time high of job postings. Um, So, yeah, it's rebounded magnificently. And, I mean, it's it's never been busier in Singapore. So both looking at the data and also just the sentiment on the ground, I can say that there's been a pretty rapid recovery. Right. So So tell us a bit about some of those... um, uh, uh, solutions, or at least um, the, uh, I mean, for example, I mean, the fiscal stimulation, surely, I mean, was, uh, like everywhere, everywhere else, or in most countries. Um, how have that, how has that been, how effective has it been? And, um, mm-hmm. and, and, and I know, I understand that there was some kind of shift. You saw a lot of uh, people who had been in, in, in corporate careers, for example, and they shift over to the gig economy. Um, mm. uh, give us a handle, and then of course uh, an increase in entrepreneurship, just out of sort of necessity. Necessity mm. being, uh, in, in, in the mother of invention, or is it the, uh, invention yes. the mother of necessity? I, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, t- tell us a bit about how that worked in Singapore. Yeah, so the government um, was really smartly partnering with the private sector. So they've partnered with IBM, they've partnered with BCG, they've partnered with Google, and they also partnered with the education sector. So um, um, National University of Singapore, Trent College, etc. So there was a lot of initiatives run by the Infocom and Media Development Association of Singapore, whereby they would fund these big reskilling programs. Um, so we've been quite um, closely involved with a couple of them, with with BCG and with Google, whereby thousands of people have been taken into sort of six to nine month long reskilling programs. Um, and they're actually trained by the companies, um, you know, in data analytics, digital transformation um, digital sales and marketing. So sort of very much future ready, future proof. Um, skills areas all around the digital economy Um, and a lot of the people that go into these courses they are actually in their mid-career so they've probably been working for 15 years or possibly up to 25 years so they could be anything from age 35 to age 55 or even 60 Um, and it's fair to say when they were first graduating from university like they were not entering the world of work which was helping them digitally. Um, so th- it, they kind of they, they're a slightly sort of missed generation when it comes to their skills development, because by the time a lot of digital tools and, and techniques and tactics were being used in the workplace, a lot of these people are already in management positions and they get 
the, the new grads would come in with the digital knowledge and these guys would be more sort of managing at the higher end. So unfortunately, what happened in COVID is there was a lot of redundancies and these people found themselves out of work and then they felt obsolete. It was actually very hard for them to get back into work because they're not digitally equipped. And now all jobs ask for that. I mean, even if you've been working as an accountant, they would now want you to have some sort of data analytics skills to come back into the accountancy role. And they didn't have it at the age of 50. So the government's been partnering with universities and, and private companies to develop these skills in that sector of person. Otherwise, we were finding out they were actually going to be Uber drivers, Grab drivers. Um, you know, they were going into gig economy roles, which had nothing to do with their corporate career. So it was a massive loss of talent from the workforce. And this is at a time when Singapore is desperately short of talent. Um, so, you know, it makes a lot of sense to try and, you know, train the talent that you have and, and bring them back into the workforce and extend their working career. Right. Thanks. Uh, uh, Catherine, I'll get back to you because I think one thing uh, we would like to do maybe towards the end is think about, well, what things uh, in terms of the impact of COVID, um, what things will be kind of lasting and, and what things are, you know, more are short or medium term given the, the remedies that, how do you see things shifting? And and we'll get back to that, uh, to you on that. Can I, if I could move to uh, Alex, uh, if you could uh, uh Tell us about your perspective, because you are you, you uh, from wh where you're standing. You you have a, a, an idea of the of the human resource shifts and and how workers have felt through the pandemic and and how they're reacting now that we're in recovery. Thank you, Alejandro. I'm going to talk about something which is very close to me. Because I'm also an executive coach. I don't do much coaching. But I'm certified. I have my qualifications from INSEAD. And I'm using the coaching tools a lot in my business. And it's very interesting what is happening right now with the remote work. Most of us would believe that remote work is fantastic, that this is a new achievement, that this is something which we are jumping into and so, are so happy about that. But we are missing a lot of points here. Uh, it's uh, extensive research being done right now on remote work and its psychological consequences. But let me tell you that if it was a real crisis, uh, as we possibly all of us participated in the past, we would be meeting physically, we would be going for dinners, we would be talking, we would be having small talks, etc., etc. we would be joking about things. This is not present. Yeah? If we meet each other in the street tomorrow, we wouldn't recognize each other. I had this experience recently, I had a physical meeting with Vienna with a group of people out of which I didn't know two of them. And that was really, really strange because we were talking on the video calls a lot uh, during the last year and a half. And then when we saw each other, said, oh, this is you, I wouldn't recognize. So for instance, one thing is I'm very tall. I'm almost two meters tall. So everybody will say, oh, I didn't know you were tall, etc. So like, all the human touch disappeared or it's merely existing. Yeah? And if you... Think about it from the psychological consequences uh, point of view. We are pack species. Yeah? We, we basically will live in a pack uh, to the evolution. Uh, we were always pack species. So being a member of the pack is very important to us. All of a sudden, all of these little things associated with the office, with the workplace, the meetings at the coffee machine, the meetings, uh, you know, the water cooler, all of that is gone. Yeah. We don't have the small talk with the friend from our colleague from work about family, about this, about that. All of a sudden we go to business and we talk about the business and it's sometimes coming to the extreme. So for instance, my adult son is working uh, for McKinsey uh, from his <laughs> place and he, he's not a consultant. He's covering HR for a couple of countries and he's sticking to his computer for 19 hours a day. Just looking at the computer all the time. <laughs> and this is not what we as pack animals, we are evolved uh, to do. This is not our natural behavior. And the psychological consequences will be there. We don't know what kind of consequences will be bearing, but for sure this is going to happen. So uh, we need to, and the question probably immediately arises, is there something we can do about it? 
Yes, we can. Yeah, we can, if possible, organize a physical meeting once in a while so that we have also this sense of presence, smell, touch, everything which we are used to and which normally existed in our lives and now it's gone. Yeah? Uh, we should also bear in mind that not everybody is happy about just being at home and work from home because there are people with small apartments and kids, for instance. So for them, going to the office was almost like a relaxation. Oh my God, I can go to the office and finally have some time for my own, you know, just nobody's disturbing me all the time. Uh, we can also, as Alejandro did, instead of going straight to business on a video call in a workplace, we can also spend a couple of minutes talking about small things, doing some icebreaker exercises, some warming up, talking about kids, about family, asking how people feel, et cetera, et cetera, so that we feel more normal in this workspace. And this is not going to be a wasted time. This is going to be a time very, very well invested in building a team spirit, because what kind of team is that if this is just a video team, right? <laughs> it's very difficult. And by the way, this is going into interesting directions because I know companies, they don't even have an office. Size of a company, everything yeah. happens in, in the video. So. <laughs> Indeed, um, I had a whole consulting career without an office for 13 years, so there we go. Um, can, I, can I challenge you a bit on this because, um, sorry, I don't want to use a kind of flippant expression, but, but, but just to be devil's advocate, first world problem, kind of, you know, in other words, what you're talking about uh, you know, okay, uh, it, it's tough. You're 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 a white collar worker at office, and 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 COVID has had has made you uh, isolated to some extent. There are psychological stresses. You miss the team aspect of it, and and all of that. But hey, I mean, at the end of the day, um, if the productivity is still there, um, and the costs have come down. And you get to actually spend time with your family, even though it may be a cramped apartment. Um, you're not traveling as much. Your uh, carbon footprint has been severely reduced, but you're still productive. So, so why not? What's not to like about that? In the sense, like boohoo, uh, if you if, if it's tough to work at home, um, you know. Again, I, I don't mean to be insensitive. I'm just saying first world problem, right? Well, I do recognize that and I agree with you, Alejandro. Yeah. Obviously, this, not, <clears throat> this issue does not apply to people who are working somewhere physically, you know, in Indonesia, for instance, you know, in a power plant, et cetera, et cetera. There's no doubt about it. And uh, also, uh, I do recognize all the pluses, all the advantages which remote work is bringing to us. There's no doubt about it. All I was trying to say is that there are also minuses, yeah? there are also some things that we might be better off. Imagine that you are the CEO of a company. For some people, it's chief emotional, obviously. <laughs> Not, and, and the big part of being a CEO, it is actually that, being the chief emotional officer, you have to make sure that actually the productivity stays in place. And part of being productive means feeling okay, feeling well. Yeah? So this is what I'm saying, that just let's not assume that remote work is all the good things right. and benefits, because there are some costs to it attached and this cost we will be seeing more and more in the future so we can prevent it to some extent and we can make it better yeah. yes. I, I think you're absolutely right because I mean you know uh, webinars such as this I mean not to dis disrespect this particular webinar but um, I do so many of them this is actually my third of the day um, and it's <coughs> after you've gone to many weeks like that, where you have many days where you're doing more than one, it, it does, you know, it does great. And then uh, you do miss the in-person aspect. I mean, I think one good thing in Hong Kong is of course that we, we never really had any real lockdown here. So the, you know, the interaction in the office was still, uh, was still going. Um, okay. Um, uh, offer, offer, are you, uh, are you there? Uh, are, you, are you coming in and out? Um, I'm wondering if you're in or out at the moment. I see you're on the list. Uh, well, maybe I'm going to go to um, Pietro. Um, if you could, uh, you're, you're in the policy space. Um, 
uh, tell us your, 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 your perspective from where you are, and uh, you're in Brussels at the moment. Um, uh, what is the, um, what do you see as the impact, I, I suppose the immediate impact, but let's start getting into what's the sort of lingering longer impact of the pandemic on the workplace, on employment, on the ability of people to have a decent, have decent work. Um, thanks, Alejandro. And uh, um, you know what Alex has just put on the on the table here is of is of much interest. Uh, just to start and do the ice breaking, as he was saying, uh, just to let you know that last week I had my first online class with my students after three months. I, I was in presence for three months, but we at all to to wear the mask. So I, for the first time, I saw the face of my students <laughs> because I was not able to recognize them uh, walking down the street. Sometimes they were saying, hey, professor. And I realized, who is this guy? Because, you know, they took off their mask. When they were in class, they had their mask. Sometimes they have hats and caps. So it's, you know, yeah, new generation. Um, but it's, it, it's true what you, you just said. And then I moved to my topic here. It, is it true that we are missing? And I agree uh, that that personal uh, element or that fact of staying together uh, as humans that's our main characteristics is mobility the fact that we can move and here in Europe for two years our mobility was somehow uh, a stop or or under control and the second is to live together and being online has a lot of great advantages I definitely agree but I think that Alex is right there will be some cost that we will uh, sooner or later experience. Um, when, it, when it comes to decent work conditions and the, the impact of uh, pandemic, and I would say the impact of new policies, you know, that's what I'm, uh, what I'm working on, what I'm researching on and, and for the past, um, for the past years. Um, for instance, what we notice is that in Malaysia, uh, where there are big plantations of different crops, including uh, oil palm, there was a shortage of, uh, of workers. Why? Because there was no migration. So people could not migrate or go and work in Malaysia. And that has a terrible impact, not just on workers that can move there and get better working conditions. Uh, somebody would disagree that this is a better working condition, but uh, uh, people move to Malaysia, for instance, for uh, finding a job in these uh, plantations. But the result was that the price of the crops have increased. And today it's contributing to increase the price of commodities uh, all around the world. Uh, what we are also experiencing is that all this uh, sustainability, uh, let's say, trend in policies, po uh, public policies by governments, but also inside companies, is uh, supposedly creating better condition for uh, workers. Uh, but what we fear and what we experience, at least here in, in Europe, where new policies are coming, and I'm talking about policies, for instance, for reducing deforestation, policies for, for protecting biodiversity, uh, policies that somehow have an impact or should have an impact on what we call a change. I have in the long term, in the years to come, an impact on workers, uh, I did my, and I'm doing some uh, some uh, specific job on smallholders in Asia, particularly Malaysia, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, Philippines. And what we fear is that this new policy regulation that Europe is going to introduce in the coming years that are meant for a good purpose, that is sustainability and therefore reduction of deforestation, are Im implying a big control over uh, the supply chain. And you know, Workers are at the very beginning of the supply chain, particularly in Asia, when all commodities that are coming to Europe. And tough regulation might increase the cost of the supply chain and particularly cost of labor. And smallholders in these countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, for instance, is if they are not engaged in this process, if there are not investments to educate them, if there are not resources to explain them what, for instance, sustainability is and why they should invest sustainability, well, at that point, they will risk to lose their job. They will risk to be left out of this sustainable revolution. And this might have negative implication on, on the labor market in Asia. So instead of, on one side, we achieve sustainability. On the other side, we, we risk to lose uh, jobs and to leave people out of the uh, of the labor market, and this could be a risk. We're we're and I do a little bit of, of advertising for my work. Uh, on, on December 14th, we're holding 
uh, a conference, a conference, an online conference again, <laughs> uh, with uh, people from uh, Central America, Latin, and people from uh, Asia, and particularly small older. So we're talking about the small families that own a farming business in uh, uh, in Asia. And we have found out that farmers and plantations, so that the farmers working in plantation are creating a tremendous development opportunity. Uh, people that 10, 20, 30 years ago started working in this plantation, now they have kids who are going to school before they were not going to school. I'm talking about area in Asia, you know, one of the 17,000 islands of Indonesia, where they have the opportunity finally to go to school and possibly not to go back and work in the uh, uh, farming, but to move to Jakarta or to move to other areas and get better jobs. And then maybe going even back to the farming of their family, but bringing technology that means increasing, you know, managerial skills or on the other increasing uh, the use of technology and therefore uh, productivity. So my point is, if we want Asia market, you know, after COVID to recover, and we're talking about equal recovery, not just for, let's say, the lucky ones, uh, like the one living in big cities or in Singapore or in, 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 in Kuala Lumpur in Jakarta. We need policies that are, you know, uh, engaging everybody. What I see the risk here in Europe is the great ambition of uh, achieving sustainability. But my fear is that this might have negative implication uh, in uh, what we call developing countries. But as you know, living there, those are no longer developing countries, are well-developed countries with a lot of people, a lot of people that need to work and they need better conditions. Yeah. Petra, I'm wondering, uh, can you identify any examples of mitigating policies or programs that uh, you see that are actually doing what you're talking about needs to be done? Uh, well, right, right now, and these are on the table here the, uh, in, in Brussels, I'm in Brussels right now, um, the attempt of the European Union to reduce deforestation, so zero deforestation policies, right. who are asking specific uh, uh, crops, uh, palm oil, cocoa, banana, and I remember, oh, there is a list that will be increased. And these commodities, when coming to Europe, if the legislation is uh, obviously uh, implemented, when it they, they come to Europe, and it's not clear how this is going to work, but they have to be fully zero deforestation. Uh, and there must be a certification. So let's say if you import palm oil, that has to be zero deforestation. And I think it's an amazing revolution that Europe is doing. But when you have, as a company, to monitor your supply chain, you have to make sure that everybody in the supply chain is following these rules. And when we think about a small family of holders of a plantation in Malaysia or Indonesia, that's very hard. It means you need to engage them. It needs to give them opportunities. Uh, but if they are not able to do it in a cer certain time that Europe wants, then they risk to lose their job because the big multinational will say, hey, you and these people will lose their job and will lose their opportunities. So my point is, when you do in Europe this kind of regulation, you need to consider the impact that they might have on labor in some remote areas of the world, remote for us here in Europe, uh, but very important for, <laughs> for Asia, and therefore trying to engage them with investments. If I was a producing country, I would be a bit upset with Europe saying, you're doing a great job, but we need to be engaged. And probably we need also some investments in our country so that we can train our workers and understand what sustainability is. There is a little paradox. I don't want to take too much time. But on one side, you are asking us to be sustainable. On the other side, in some cases, you are boycotting some of our products. And you need a balance there. You cannot ask and then boycott. You need to fully engage us and uh, put some investments in, in the labor market. So this actually requires a multilateral effort. In other words, you can't just do it from the uh, investing side or, or the demand side. Or, uh, uh, you have to yes. order the supplier side. There's got to be some kind of meeting with the minds here. Um, yes. And, and, and that's interesting. Uh, great. Uh, Catherine, if I could get back to you, I, I think, um, sorry, I just met, I saw a note from Offer that he's having uh, sound issues. So uh, if I can get back to you, um, when, when you're looking at the um, employment, human resources landscape now, so devastated by the pandemic, 
and people have shifted around to doing different things, potentially uh, a lot of things that, that, that maybe they, they didn't anticipate they would have to do. Um, what do you see as the, you know, if, 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 and you've seen these remedies you've, you've talked about um, that the government uh, and, and companies have adopted. Um, what is the lasting impact though, of the pandemic? What will, will the pandemic have uh, any significant uh, major shift in not just Singapore uh, workplaces in Singapore, but 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 do you see any w things that will really change? I mean, uh, we've already talked a bit about the, that kind of virtual work, uh, the the work from home aspect that maybe we'll end up with, with some kind of hybrid there. But what other shifts might you see? Um, is it in people understanding that they now, that they really need to have lifelong learning or things like that? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, um, I mean, the hybrid workplace is a, a really big one. And in a, in a country like Singapore, where it's very expensive to employ people, um, then there's been a pattern emerging for years to employ people offshore. So, you know, some countries have um, worked very well with Singapore to have offshore availability, whether that's the Philippines, India, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Thailand. Like there's a lot of tech talent that has been sourced in those countries, tech teams. Um, but actually, um, it, it was within it was relatively within one one sort of area that that was working, whereas now we see that there are people working from Australia or Bali and it's kind of corporate jobs jobs which would never have been considered to be offshored in the past and now um, if it's hybrid workplace and somebody needs to do their job for like an entire month from somewhere different they can do it um, and there's a massive talent shortage in Singapore because of having had the borders closed for two years the usual kind of circulation of talent which I mean Singapore is usually a very international city with a lot of circulation of talent um, now the, the crunch has got to the point where companies um, are considering sourcing globally for all sorts of corporate functions. So not the typical offshore functions, not the nomad who wants to go and live in Bali for the month, but like, let's just employ someone who just lives in London to do this job. And that's a change. Um, so in the past, people would have been expected to, to come here and live in Singapore. Um, and then it costs you the cost of having someone in Singapore. But now, I mean, London wouldn't be much cheaper for you. But there, there are plenty of countries where you can find cheaper talent now to do the work. So I think I think that aspect of um, borderless talent is is a big change. And I think that's going to represent quite a lot of issues for HR. Um, if you're employing in that country, what are the local labor laws? Um, what what taxations are you subject to? Like there are some questions about having your members of staff dotted all around the world, which HR teams will need to catch up on. Um, so so that's one thing. Um, secondly, there has been a massive increase in entrepreneurship in in Singapore. So um, we we've lost a lot of com companies. I mean, you can see a lot of small companies who've stopped trading. Um, and net net, we've actually gained a lot more. So on the um, the government registry we lost about 70,000 companies in the last year but we've gained about 100,000 so like net net there are 30,000 more companies now than there were a year ago um, and um, so these are mostly these are people who were displaced you know they were retrenched they didn't have a job and um, a lot of them are working in professional services so for a lot of people who can um, you know trade on their lifelong experience and their career experience by lending themselves as a consultant like that is the route that they're choosing to take now so that's obviously going to make some big differences as well as to how companies achieve their goals like is it through um staff or is it by hiring a vendor you know so and, and in singapore it has not been typical for there to be a contract workforce like it is it is not a country in the world where there's a lot of contractors and freelancers and consultants compared to other countries um, there's a very low um, take up on that in the past because people felt that it's quite a risk averse com country and people <laughs> like to take a permanent job with a well-known company. Like that's the typical behavior pattern. So so actually people being pushed by discomfort into starting a business of their own and becoming a contractor slash vendor, it's, it's a huge shift and it creates a much more 
flexible workforce and a workforce which is more responsible for itself in terms of its own training and its own accountability. So I do think that there'll be an uptick in training and development and lifelong learning because once you're self-employed, like these are the kind of things you need to take some more responsibility for yourself. So I think that could affect as well the education sector and the way that it's conducted. So these are some huge changes which have been, you know, jump started because of COVID. Like they, they would not have been happening if it wasn't. For the but you anticipate my um, my uh, follow up because I was going to ask about the education sector. Um, mm. Now Singapore actually has a fairly well evolved uh, and sophisticated education system and um, higher education. Uh, but is it a matter of uh, trying to fill in gaps like vocational training and other things like that that would be necessary? What, what are your thoughts? But you know, you, it, it, some of the best universities are in Singapore, but but maybe that's not where the solutions lie. Mm, I, I strongly agree that the vocational training is the last mile that is missing in the current system. So let's take the big government skilling programs, and they it's been wonderful to put people through a program where they learn about cloud architecture architecture, design thinking, um, you know, um, um, digital roadmap and digital transformation. But is someone now willing to employ them in that job? And that's where you need some, a vocational bridge, which takes you from the educational learning into being able to actually do that job at, at, at a level to which you're accustomed. I mean, even if you're willing to trade a little bit of seniority and salary, you're, you're not necessarily going to go as a 55 year old all the way back down to the graduate job. Right. Um, so there's a last mile, which I think hasn't been quite catered to yet, which which is the vocational experience. And the, the government's trying on some of that, um, but it, it's it's either handed back to the corporate sector to kind of figure this out you must employ people and then mentor them or it's down to the learners themselves. Well, you've had the training now, like make it work. And, and they're frustrated. Like they can't make it work. And so then their question is, do I have to go back to my old job? Like I've just done a six month intensive course, which was, you know, 18 months condensed, condensed into a six month program, but now I can't find a job using those skills. So that's frustrating. So yeah, I think there's a missing section for vocation. Thanks very much. Uh, 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 me, me, yes, just please. Jump, yes, just jumping sure. because what Catherine said is very interesting, and I'm not looking at it from a, I say, educational training part. Uh, that's not my job, but I'm I'm very intrigued uh, because you talk about at this stage of capitalism, all these contracts, all these freelancing, these working on your own, basically a self-employed uh, attitude. That I'm talking to to my students a lot, and this is this seems to become a form of contract right now. But the question is now the costs are shift to the worker basically and no longer on the company, particularly for welfare. Um, so I think that this will more and more ask, and I don't have an answer for that, but for a different type of welfare. Uh, you know, income, some people are critical, some are in favor, but I think that something needs, uh, needs to be done because again, you lose your job, who's paying for that? Are you training? Who's paying for your training? Um, who's, you know, recognized that you've been done some effort, the, the vocational practitioner was talking. So I think we need to rethink, this is not the topic today, but I think it could be the conclusion, but think a bit our welfare system. I think that's interesting because just to inject a bit of China into this, I mean, if you look at the, um, the concept of common prosperity that folks are talking about, I mean, in many ways, that's uh, China is saying, well, we don't really want to go down the the Scandinavian models of welfare state, but we want to have a combination of different things. And one area that um, uh, the leadership is in China is, 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 is stressing is, uh, is philanthropy, corporate philanthropy and, 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 uh, and, and beyond. And, and, and is there uh, a way that they can step that up uh, in order to address the inequality issues? Um, thank you for that. Um, Alex, I'm wondering if I could um, tap your uh, you're both your coach side as well as your corporate side in the sense like, well, if you're coaching um, someone today who's confronted with maybe unemployment but, or, or, or precarity, uh, if I can put it that way, um, because of the pandemic, uh, what, what would you be saying? Well, you know, and, and then on, on the 
on, on your corporate side, um, well, what are the new responsibilities, if there are any, that corporations must sort of adopt post-pandemic? Uh, starting from the corporations, uh, I agree. Uh, I agree that uh, what Pietro, for instance, was saying that the company of today needs really to pay a little bit more attention to the welfare of the contractors. You know, because, you, know you can always say, well, it's none of my business. I mean, whatever they do, they do. But then at the end of the day, you're also paying the cost. Uh, somebody gets sick, somebody is not feeling well, somebody is not performing well. So this is only logical. That this is why the good companies, they're actually paying attention to that. The mediocre and poor companies, the bad companies, they are not paying attention because they don't care. But then very, very rarely they are really becoming the world leaders. They are very rarely are becoming the very profitable, very, very good companies. They may be profitable for a while, but in the long run, the winner is the company that is creating very dedicated workforce. And to create dedicated workforce, you really need to engage people because the slaves don't work well in today's world. So this is, um, and if somebody lost the hair of his job, well, I, I would say, <laughs> because this is a particular school of coaching, which is also promoted by INSEAD, is basically not really telling people what they should do. It's trying to incentivize them, wake them up, uh, connect them with the emotions, and identifying the solution themselves as a result. Uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, losing your job is a very dramatic experience. It's a very traumatic experience for a lot of people. And so uh, the most important thing is that you really stick to yourself, to your emotions psychologically, and uh, that you do whatever is possible to find a new one. But part of that is not losing your self-confidence. Uh, part of that is not falling into some sort of depression, you know, or not feeling too blue, uh, colloquially speaking. So uh, this is very important for everybody. And we know, probably all of us, this type of experience from the past, that if something bad happened, the most important thing is to ju just uh, go to the bad emotions, recognize them, have the feeling inside of you, and then start building a new, and then start building something from scratch sometimes. Uh, so, so this is, yeah. but, this but is what people can do. I ask you, yeah, can I ask you, about, though, about there's this phenomenon that people are talking about, about sort of mass resignations or people who are just saying like, they may not be unhappy. It's just they're saying the pandemic has made them um, rethink their lives, direction, work-life balance. And indeed, in China, they're talking about this sort of tongue-ping movement, uh, lying flat movement of many young people saying, well, you know, why be in the rat race and just lie flat and see how things go? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not necessarily a matter of psychological stress per se. I mean, they may be motivated by stresses, but at least uh, a, a sense that there's better things in life than 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 being working so hard. And there are, and there are, and I I do believe that uh, finding the right work-life balance is very very important. And uh, as a lot of people, and I was part of this generation. Uh, participating in a rat race. I was working as an investment banker for many years, et cetera, et cetera. And it's always a price attached to the price you have to pay for it at some point of time. So there's one side of the coin is you make very decent money. The other side of the coin is that you have very little family life or very, very little life for that matter. So the young people start, a lot of young people start recognizing that and they say, no, no, I want to have a work-life balance from now on. You know, I'm not interested in working every Saturday and every Sunday. I'm not interested in working during the night. No, this is the time for my family. This is the time for my friends. And I kind of like this approach. I have to say that this is something which really shows uh, maturity of this young uh, people who started working. And they, they say this, this is a very interesting phenomena, this generation X, Y, Z, millennials, etc., etc. There's a lot of research about that. And uh, they are different than the generation which I represent, but it's, it's nice. You have to approach them differently. You have to talk to them differently. You have to recognize their feelings. It's interesting. It's very interesting. I, I presume that uh, 
all of us have a lot of experience. And Pietro probably is teaching a lot of these guys. And, well, you know, in fact, uh, if, <laughs> we have only about a minute left. Uh, if I can just get a quick word from you, Pietro, Pietro about your views on um, the young, the, 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 the generation that's coming up, the, the students you're talking about, uh, do you see them as maybe redefining what decent work means? Uh, and then yes. any closing comments? Yes, I, I, I agree with Alex, at least with his perspective. I tend to be a bit more pessimistic than him. You know, like even the ancient Greek were looking at the past and say, oh, the past was much better. So we tend to, uh, to do that. But I see the students have a totally different approach to work. I mean, I, I, I guess guys, we're almost in the same age, but I would say that we, I grew up, I grew up with the idea of getting a long life later job. Actually, I'm not. I'm having any constant change in my job. These guys are are growing, are um, mat maturing in the idea that we'll keep changing jobs and actually that they not have a fixed job. And uh, uh, I do not honestly know how this will evolve, uh, but their approach with, with life, I would say, with labor, with uh, social life is totally different uh, than ours. And technology has a great impact on that for sure. Uh, if I even think about the, the, the time they f dedicate to studying, it's totally different from ours. They, they are not able to focus for longer than a certain few seconds, I, even, I would even say. And Facebook, Instagram are an example. doesn't mean they are not studying. They are studying a different way. Um, so even uh, l uh, teaching programs or learning programs should be adapted uh, to that. Some of my colleagues think we should something. Hey, no, we should stay as we are. They, they need to study. Uh, I don't know. I, as a teacher, you know, uh, when I started, I was a professor. My professors were like people with great knowledge. Uh, now I feel more of a tutor, somebody that is sort of puzzling together different patches of knowledge and uh, guiding students through that. And I think it's a totally different approach from when, when I was a student, when I was a kid. Great. Um, great. Thank so you very it's much. All, I, it's all uh, ahead of us. It's all ahead of us. Great. Great. Thanks very much. I'll give the last word to Catherine. If maybe you, your, your thoughts on this particular issue is, I think, very important because, of course, we're talking about uh, a lot, particularly in certain countries with youth bulges, particularly places like Vietnam, the Philippines, in, uh, India, Indonesia, that this will be very key. How, you know, what does what does this gen new generation coming up, what do they mean by decent work? Yeah, um, I mean, they we do recruit into Vietnam, to, um, Thailand, etc. So we, we work with all of those nations and um, we focus on the technology and digital sector. So the, the people we work with are in a very privileged place, like where they have got themselves to the place where they are going to be in demand. Um, so those younger people, um, they've got mobility and they'll be able to move around nations. Um, you know, they get paid well, they can move jobs every year if that's what they want. Like they, the, the world is their oyster. So the companies will just do everything they can to try and get them. Um, and then and then they will lose them again a year later. So <laughs> they, well, uh, decent yes. work for them is is um, get yourself skilled in technology. That That is what I would define most younger people's um, right. ambitions around Asia, yeah. Great. Thanks very much all, all, uh, uh, to our panelists. Uh, uh, just a quick summary. I mean, I, it's probably a good way to end it is to talk about technology because one of the, the conventional wis bits of wisdom these days is that the pandemic accelerated digitalization uh, in all parts of the world and in com companies and in our own lives. And so, um, you know, decent work, uh, I would argue at whatever level, uh, you know, uh, will require uh, some kind of understanding, adoption, or innovative use of technology because everything is digitalizing, and the pandemic is certainly um, digitalizing things significantly. So whether it's a, a career as a professional or a vocational career or what have you, uh, technology will be quite important, and that goes into the whole reskilling issue, which um, uh, I would argue is uh, we've talked about it in the context of uh, agricultural workers. We've talked about it in the context of workers who have shifted from, say, corporate jobs to gig, the gig economy, that reskilling becomes very important. And it's not necessarily about 
reskilling um, by going to university again or going to conventional schools, but uh, there are many ways now and avenues to do it. And in the active technology, one way to do it is to avail of what's available through technology, but as well as to become more technologically savvy if you can. So that's, I guess, my, my bit of summary. But thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much, Alex. And thank you very much, Pietro. I'm so sorry, Offer uh, was uh, having difficulties. And um, so, but thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Alejandro. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to stop the streaming. There we go.